yes, Lord, do it here. Do it again. Your simple, beautiful, powerful presence is all we need. Manifest yourself in us. I pray for the generations that have gone before. You would stir again a hunger in us to see this move in our generations. That it's not just about the younger generations, but it's about the ones that have gone before. The ones that have prayed that this would happen. God, we praise you for the Methodist move of God to pray for revival. And that they see it manifesting in the young people. God, this is exactly what we need. This is exactly what we need in this hour. Is for a great coming to your love. A great drawing to your presence, a purification of our hearts and our minds, a radical turn from one way to another, to your way, to your path, to your heart, God. Draw all men to yourself, God, every generation. Awaken us to the hunger in the generations that are coming up behind us to feed them, to pray for them, to anoint them, to carry on with them, to guide them forward. Anoint us, Lord, in the millennial generation and the boomers and all of the generations that have come before. We praise you for the generations that have prayed and prayed and prayed and waited on you. I wait patiently on the Lord. He is here, church. He is here today. He is here when you wake up in the morning in your bedroom. He is there when you go to work. He is there in the most thickest part of your day. He is there. He is present, and he is your ever-present help in every time of trouble and every time of glory. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. God is moving. (sighs) Wow. So today we are still in our series, Can You Feel It? And I wanted to say something when Leslie was sharing about water baptism. In two weeks, we have a water baptism service here on a Sunday. And I was listening to a sermon earlier this week. It may have actually been, Art, the one that I sent you, a podcast. And the the pastor was talking about water baptism, and I thought this was so cool because Although water baptism does not save you, there is power in water baptism. And there is something that happens in those waters when we recognize the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and we identify with him in his death and we identify with him in his resurrection Something supernatural takes place, and the pastor was speaking on water baptism, and he said the early church, early church used to say that it is in the waters of baptism the dragons die. It is in the waters of baptism the dragons die. That is the power of the life of Jesus that we identify with in water baptism, that when you come up out of those waters, we've seen people healed, baptized in the Holy Spirit, set free. There is power in that moment. We do not take it lightly. And so if you want to be baptized and and recognized by the world as a follower of Jesus, please sign up for that. It's going to be a powerful Sunday in two weeks. We spent the day yesterday in a training for what is called dinner church. God is moving and providing. And I just want to put a little plug in for this moment. The Lord is multiplying disciples and believers. That's what we're supposed to be. If we're not multiplying, if we're not making disciples, we're dead. We're not alive in Christ. Come on. Are you with me? If we are not telling someone about Jesus, something is wrong in here. He is so good. And if that causes a conviction on your heart, I pray it's a holy, healthy conviction. Go tell someone. Go tell someone. Ask the Lord for opportunities, but don't shy away from saying his name. Amen? And we we sat in this training yesterday, and a, a year ago... God dropped a building in our lap, literally, free of charge, no mortgage. It came with money in the bank to pay the bills. 
in Barnhill Midville area. We have a building. And I don't know if we've told you, we've kind of sat on it for about a year prayerfully. We took the board, we took the dream team, we walked through the building, we prayed over it. We've talked and talked and prayed and waited on God to say what, what to do, when and where and how. And God has led us on a journey through the Ohio Ministry Network to something called Dinner Church. And I've been reading a book, it's called Welcome to Dinner Church. And it is a place to come sit at the table because Jesus did ministry at the table. That's kind of why I like this table here with us. Like, it's nice. I can lean on it when I need to. But Jesus did ministry at the table. And God has birthed a team, and it's just a baby team right now. We need it to fully grow. But Scott and Angel have given their yes to helping lead a dinner church revival in Barn Hill. And we'll talk more about it, but if that doesn't get you excited about what God is doing through this body, through this beautiful body of believers, I don't know what will. We're birthing a church, and you are a part of that. So I just am going to just leave this little plug in before we get into the message because I want you to pray about Dinner Church. If you want to know more, we're going to be talking about it more, but it's a powerful, powerful representation of the love of God and sitting with people right where they are and just having supper with them and telling Jesus stories. The, the buffet table represents the abundant grace of God. There's so much weaved into it. It's so beautiful, and it's what the Lord is calling us to do next. So and It takes the church back to Acts chapter 2. Yeah. yeah. It's a representation of how the church organically uh, came to be after the resurrection of Christ and how they would meet daily in one another's homes, around the table, fellowship together, communion together. And it takes that philosophy of church because it wasn't until a few hundred years ago that churches began meeting in this kind of a context. It hasn't always been this way. And it takes church back to the original church of Acts chapter 2 to where they met around the table with one another. Amen. And it's, it's, it's a movement that's worldwide, Dinner Church is, and the Assemblies of God is part of that. And there are currently 20 dinner churches in Ohio that are active and more being planted every year. And so it's super exciting, and we're excited for Barnhill and this beautiful property that the Lord has just given to us. Um, and we want to honor him. In There's that. a story behind that, and we'll share oh, yeah. that in the future, too. Yeah. But we just wanted to drop a little nugget of asking you to pray with us. Pray about it yourself. Don't just pray with, oh, Lord, send them. <laughs> Come on. Oh, Lord, bless them as they make these decisions. No, Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, what are you doing in this house? Because we've been equipped. We are in intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has called you. And you can't just continue to say, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. You're ready now, today. You may not feel it, you may not know it, but he says, go ye therefore. As soon as you receive Jesus, you have something to offer. So pray with us, pray for us, but pray with us about what God is up to. It's good. It is twofold. Yeah. When Jesus... He challenges his followers, pray to the Lord of the harvest to thrust out laborers into the harvest field, right? The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. We talked about this on Wednesday night as well. Um, the, the literal translation of what he says there is, as you go, pray mm. to the Lord of the harvest. So there is a going and a praying. It's twofold. We're to do both. Amen. We go and we pray. It's exciting. Yep. Well, we're going to share more with you on all of that, but we're going to go ahead and get into the word. Would you bow your heads with me? (sighs) Father, we thank you for your word, for your rhema word and for the written word. We praise you for both, for your spoken word as you speak to our hearts and for the words that are written on the pages of Scripture that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be redacted. It's so powerful, the stories of Christ that you have placed in our hands. God, I pray for your word to come alive in us this morning, for our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to be loved. We praise you for your 
holy conviction, for your holy love that burns in us and moves us closer to you. Your goal is not that we get pushed farther away, but that you draw us into yourself to have an intimacy, an intimate knowledge of who you are, each one of us, no one left out, no one in this room, when you call out on the name of Jesus, does he call back you're unworthy? Not one, no one. When you cry out to Jesus, he comes running to you, and you are in him and he is in you. And I thank you, Lord, for that reality that we walk in, that we live in every day that you are drawing us close, that you are drawing us to your heart, and that you're sharing your secrets, your treasures with us as we lean into you, as we lean into the tense places, the places we're unsure, the places we're hurting, the places that are broken, the places that are good. As we lean into those places into you, you refresh us, you restore us, you heal us, you teach us, you mold us, you shape us, and we praise you for that. We thank you for your word. Amen. It's too, it's too she fumbled for words and then bursting out laughing. Why, it's just too preposterously absurd. It's crazy. Whatever will you do next? The shepherd laughed too. I love doing preposterous things, he replied. Why, I don't know anything else more exhilarating and delightful than turning weakness into strength, faith, fear into faith, and that which has been marred into perfection. I don't know anything more than to take whatever you think your ultimate weakness is and turning it into your ultimate strength, because that's what Jesus does. Amen? Amen. I love that. That's a quote from Heinz Feet on High Places. It's so beautiful. It's such a powerful book. And he it's the shepherd talking to a girl named Much Afraid. And she's walking through a salvation transformation from becoming much afraid to her new name, Grace and Glory. He has given you a new name. And he's walking with you. Today we have a word. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? We've been talking about, can you feel it? When you're sitting in the tension of the trauma, when you're sitting in the tension of the broken places, what do you do? Do you lean into the tension or do you run from it? Do you bury it under the rug or do you take it to Jesus? What do you do with the tension of those hard feelings? What do you do in the tension of God asking you to surrender something in your life and letting him be your discipline, letting him center you back onto the wheel like the potter's wheel that we had on the stage a few weeks ago? What do you do when he's asking you to crazily obey him into something that seems completely out of your ability? You lean into the tension, right? That's what we're practicing this year, leaning into those places where I need a good shepherd, a good pastor to come alongside me and guide me. Those places that are still broken, those places that I need the revolution, the sanctification of Christ to work in me and my salvation. Amen? So today we're going to talk about conviction. How many of you love the word conviction? The conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's something we don't actually talk about a whole lot and probably need to lean into a whole lot more because conviction is good. Conviction is good. We, I, I had for a long time, the conviction turned into guilt, shame, and condemnation, and I would beat myself up when I was convicted of a sin. When the Holy Spirit was working on me, I would just spend time, instead of receiving grace and forgiveness, I would beat myself up and try to make myself pay for my mistakes And remind myself that I did it wrong last time, so I got to do it right this time. Anybody ever do that? That's not what I'm talking about. That is not the conviction and the moving of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get into this today. The fear of the Lord we talked about last week. And the fear of the Lord isn't being afraid of God as a great um, hammer. (laughs) That he's ready to hit you on the head or a denozo slap when you do something wrong. I mean, he might do it for some of you. I don't know. But, you know, he, he is a gentle wave of mercy and kindness that draws us to repentance. Listen, the Father is so good. He's so kind. It's ridiculous. 
ridiculous. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Whew. I'm really warm. Okay. So good. It's because you're so hot. Oh, thanks. That's... Mute his microphone, Jim. <laughs> as soon as I walked in the room this morning, the Holy Spirit power hit me like, oh, like just, whoa. He is here, church. <sighs> Sitting in the tension of failure and of sin. We talked about the fear of failure, the, the fear of man. But what happens when we actually do mess up? Because, I mean, I have, I think I did yesterday. Anybody else? Okay. What happens when we fail? We talked about failure isn't fatal. So get that out of your head. Failure isn't fatal. Failure is actually an opportunity to go to another level of glory with the king, with Jesus. So what do we do when we fail, when we sin? How do we respond? First of all, I know I'm not a sinner anymore. Come on, somebody. What are you? I can't hear you. Are you a sinner saved by grace? If you've been at this church very long, you should know this by now. Are you a sinner saved by grace? Is that anywhere in this Bible? Nope, not at all. You can try and find it, and I'll give you $1,000. But it is not in there. You are a saint. Over and over again in the New Testament, after Christ came into the lives of the believers, they were called saints. So sinner, not your name anymore. Unworthy, nope, not at all how to describe you. Okay? So as a believer in Jesus Christ, when you've accepted his salvation and you're walking with him, what do you do when you have a struggle, when you have a fight going on? Maybe it's something that was passed down from generation to generation and you just can't shake that anger that you saw all of your childhood and you know it's not a part of the nature of Christ and you know it's not a part of your nature, but it just won't leave. What do you do with the failure, with the sin? What do you do? Do you live with it? Do you invite it to stay in the house and cope? What do we do? We're going to Jesus. The scripture, I was taking a shower, and does Jesus talk to you guys in the shower ever? It's like odd, but yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people. And, and I was just thinking about him and I was just overwhelmed by his love. And I was singing, and the Lord reminded me of this verse, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Listen. Listen, listen, if you don't hear anything else. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away some of the sin, who takes away a little bit, it takes away the sin of the world. And the sin of the world, what he took to the cross, we can't even imagine. I can't even bear my own sin, let alone the sin of the world. Behold, he takes away, takes it away, takes it away. Hallelujah. Come on. Takes away the sin of the world. The Father does not fear our failure. He's not like, oh, no, Susan's going to mess up. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. He does not fear our failure. He also doesn't, oh, man, there they go again. <sighs> Shame on them. Nope. I rebuke that phrase. Shame on you? No shame on you. No. In Christ, there is no shame. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Father does not fear our failure. When you fail, when you mess up, when you sin, And you don't quickly turn to the Holy Spirit, say, I need your help. Or, you know, you feel convicted, but you get offended at God for convicting you. I didn't do anything wrong. 
I'm okay. I'm, I, it, was, it was fine how I responded to that person. He was wrong. I was right. That's not ever true. <laughs> but when we build an offense towards God when he's convicting of us of sin, we all have fallen short, right? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in Christ, we've been raised up. And so when we don't respond, you know, Jesus takes it the next level. In the, in the Old Testament, in the law, it said if you murder someone, Jesus says, if you hate someone, it's like you've murdered them. Uh, I was listening to a word this week, and, the, and she was talking about this very thing. And when the Lord gets loud about one thing, it's in everything I read, it's in everything I'm hearing. Holy Spirit is working in me. And she was saying, you know, I am a murderer without Christ because I've hated. I'm a thief. Have you ever withheld from the Lord? Maybe you've never actually stolen something. Like the girls, they've been sneaking candy and hiding the wrappers behind the cupboard in the bathroom. <laughs> I'm TMI, but I'm using the bathroom and out pe peeks this gold wrapper. And I was like, what is that? And I sweep my hand behind the thing and there's all these candy wrappers behind the cupboard. And then I remember my mom, be sure your sins will find you out. Listen, I did not. I did. I hid candy under my pillow. Anybody else? <laughs> but, you know, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. We, and we, yeah, maybe I've never actually murdered somebody, but if I've ever had hate in my heart to them, toward them, Jesus says this is the same. Sin is sin is sin is sin is sin, and it's all yucky. And, you know, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they do? Did they run to God and say, crap, we just messed this whole thing up? What did they do? They hid the candy wrapper behind the cabinet. It's so funny. That happened this week. They hid. And the Lord is calling us to be his daughters and sons who are not afraid of their father, but are eager to ask him, help me. I need you. I can't do this without you. I repent. Do I justify my sin or do I take it to Jesus? Do I justify what I did or do I let him come in and help me understand? Because you know, what does the Holy Spirit's conviction feel like to you? Somebody describe it to me. Danielle, what's it feel like? Yeah, it's gentle nudging. It reminds me of the quote that you said, if there's a dissonance, remember the tuning of the strings, and if there's a dissonance, it's not him. He's always in perfect tune. It's me. What does it feel like to you, the gentle nudging of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, somebody on this side of the room? Not all at once. A tugging of your heart. Yeah. I like that. It's just like a hey. Like she said, that pressure. I kind of, it's like a finger. Like, and right there. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> I think it's really interesting because you say failure isn't fatal. Yep. <clears throat> if failure was fatal the conviction of the Holy Spirit would be a lot more blunt. But he gently convicts because he knows it's going to be okay. 
that the direction you're going, your thought process, your behavior, it's not fatal. He can come in and gently convict. That way it's not rooted in shame and guilt and condemnation, but a gentle nudging to say, you need to turn a little. You need to, to refocus. This, this path that you're on does not lead to life. But he knows it's not fatal. If it was fatal, he, I mean, he'd just slap you hard, you know. And you, what are you doing exactly that fear-based discipline approach? I do believe there's tension in it, though. Mm-hmm. Right? There's, like, this, like, not, not pressure, like, like Danielle said, like, this gentle pressure. It's like you ha- there has to be a change here. Absolutely. So there is, it, it's that I'm not going to leave you here. Come on. I'm not going to leave you here. It's like thinking about the shepherd and the sheep. He's not going to leave you in a place of danger. He's like, come on, guys, let's go. Turn your heads, walk a different way. Change the way you think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And sometimes that staff comes alongside you to catch you before you fall into a pit and, and guide you back into the path of safety. Or the hook pulls you off the, the falling cliff. Did you ever watch those reels where the sheep, they're pulling the sheep out of this, like, gully thing, and the sheep runs that way, and then it runs right back in, and I'm just like, what are you doing? And they have to pull it out again, and it runs right back in. I feel like that sheep sometimes. I learned this yesterday. Why am I doing this again? But he's so gentle to say, okay, I'm going to pull you out again. Yeah. Yeah. I did, yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 He, yep. Climb up in his lap. Yeah, she says it's a very strong stirring right here. Yeah, amen. So climb up in his lap. Don't resist his pressure, his, his gentle, t- the tension. Don't run from the tension, lean into it. Can you feel it? So finish this scripture. It is the kindness of God that It is the kindness of God that that leads to repentance. It is the kindness of God, Romans chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance. That's a very familiar passage of Scripture. Many of us know that. But keep going. Can anybody keep going after that? That's verse 4. What does verse 5 say? I didn't know. Paul says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, that means a hard heart, a heart that is, um, it will not feel any kind of remorse or regret. It's hard. Um, Because of your impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. His kindness leads us to repentance. But because our hearts are hard sometimes, when we um, do not allow ourselves 
to repent, to change the way that we think. And we continue on in our destructive lifestyle, our destructive thought processes. What we are doing is we're storing up wrath. We're storing up wrath for ourselves. There's something, there will come a day when we reap the fruit of our hard-heartedness. There is freedom in repentance. So, Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to open your Bibles or your Bible app. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read out of the, the New American Standard Bible, the NASB. 2 Corinthians. So something I've recently learned, because we are still learning every day, One of the greatest qualities a follower of Jesus can possess is being teachable, amen? We have to remain teachable. We have to remain humble and meek. And we are learning every day. Holy Spirit teaches us things every day. Downloads new revelation into our hearts and our souls. And I learned something. That Paul, so we have the books of First and Second Corinthians, but Paul actually wrote at least four books to the church in Corinth. And First Corinthians is actually his second letter, and Second Corinthians is actually his fourth letter to the church, to the Corinthian church. The first and third letters have been lost. And so Paul here in Second Corinthians chapter seven, he actually references a previous letter written to the church, but it's the third letter that we do not have. It's a lost letter to the church. And just wanted to clarify, because the very first verse here of chapter 7, verse 8, the first verse we're going to read, um, he references his letter, and that's the third letter that we do not have. Um, but this third letter was meant to bring correction and discipline to the church of Corinth, because there were issues going on that needed to be addressed. And so that's what Paul's referring to here. So we're going to start in verse 8 and read through 11. Here we go. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a little while. Hang with me here. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you may not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Do you read that? Verse 10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So zoning in there on verse 10, sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Where can we see this play out in Scripture? Okay, Let's go back to Peter. Poor Peter. We use him every time as such a good illustration of normally what not to do. Um, there are a few a very victorious moments in Peter's life. But again, we're going to go back to when he denies Jesus four times. Three, Three times. Okay. Just seeing if you're paying attention. All right. Peter denies Jesus three times in public, before crowds of people, because of fear, denies Jesus three times, something that he promised to the face of Jesus he would never do. 
Lord, I will never do that. And fast forward, Jesus, he is murdered, he is placed in the tomb, he is the resurrected Christ now, and he has come back to do some additional teaching and discipleship with his followers to instruct them how to go into all the world and preach, demonstrate the power of the gospel. And in a very sacred moment, Peter is there with Jesus. I said he's with Jesus. He just denied Jesus. Now he's with him. I don't know if I would be with him. I would probably have so much shame and guilt, I I wouldn't be able to be in the same vicinity as him. I would be in hiding like Adam and Eve. He's with Jesus, and Jesus restores him. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, yes, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Jesus restores Peter's identity. He restores Peter's sense of purpose in that moment. He does not punish Peter for his disobedience. Because Peter came with a repentant heart, a humble heart. He was meek in that moment. And Jesus restored him because Peter repented. Contrast the behavior of Peter to Judas. Judas essentially did the same thing. He sold out the Messiah. He turned him over. He betrayed him. And Peter has a repentant heart, Judas realizes he has a light bulb moment and he realizes what he's done. How does Judas respond? What does he do? What does he do before that? He eventually commits suicide, says he hangs himself. What that actually means in that cultural context is he impaled himself. He fell on a spear But what does he do before that? He returned the money. But what did he do, essentially, in returning the money, what did he say? I was wrong. He confessed, but did his confession ever lead to repentance? He never went back to Jesus. He never returned to his friend. Worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. Because Paul here says that godly sorrow leads to, produces a repentance without regret. Worldly sorrow leads to death. I love how the Passion Translation says, verse 10, God designed us to feel remorse over sin in order to produce repentance that leads to victory. This leaves us with no regrets, but the sorrow of the world works death. Peter experienced victory. He experienced redemption. Judas, because he was so laden in guilt and shame over what he had done, he saw no path back to Jesus. And he ended his life. Judas's sorrow stopped at confession. That is the difference between worldly and godly sorrow. Does your sorrow, does, does the remorse that you feel when you mess up, when you make a mistake, when you sin, does the remorse you feel, does it lead you to Jesus Or does it lead you deeper into shame? Do you understand? Godly sorrow always leads to Jesus. Why? Leslie said it. Because in Christ, there's no condemnation. There is no condemnation in Christ. So when you are in Jesus, even when you mess up, even when you fail, It's not fatal. Even when you sin, there's still no condemnation. There's still no guilt. It's been dealt with on the cross. 
And so there's no need to fear returning to Jesus, repenting to Jesus, because he's already taken care of it. It's not like he puts condemnation back onto you until you repent. There is a conviction, though, the Holy Spirit causes within you that you know something, something's not right. I need to go back to Jesus. I need to confess, and I need that confession to then lead to a repentance. What, does, what is the definition of repentance? So repentance is what? It's a changing of the way that you think. It's turning, right? I want to read this to you. Both the Hebraic and Greek concepts of repentance are literally to turn from sin and come back to God. Judas turned from his sin, but he never came back to God. Right? Okay. That is to have a change of mind, a change of direction. This involves the sorrow or remorse of our hearts before God. Repentance is not a sterile, feelingless change of direction. Paul makes it clear that godly remorse is a God-intended feeling that moves the heart back to God. Our repentance is not a work of the flesh, but the result of God's Spirit stirring our conscience. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. It's not a working of the flesh. Repentance is God stirring our conscience. Peter's godly remorse over his denial of Christ eventually led him to experience complete inner healing while Judas's remorse led to his suicide. There's a major difference. It's, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit confirms the direction we're going. We're talking about this on Thursday, the difference, the contrast between confession and repentance, because there's a major difference between the two. And Leslie opens her phone, and literally one of the first things she sees is a post dealing with the difference between confession and repentance. Then I get online on Facebook and Pastor Bradley, who him and Danielle are both uh, sick under the weather, we declare their healing in Jesus' name. He posts about the very same thing. Like, what is going on? You know, the Holy Spirit, he affirms and confirms um, what he's speaking to us through our brothers and sisters in Christ, amen? And so here's... The, the quote that Leslie read to me, Rich Velotis, pastor, pastor of New York, listen, this is what he says, we, I, uh, we, if we are not careful, the act of confession can be deceptive if it is seen as a replacement for repentance. Confession is to lead to repentance. Confession equals acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Repentance equals realignment to a realignment of life that moves us toward God in light of our confession. Repentance moves us toward God in light of our confession. We don't have to hide. We don't have to fear his wrath. Jesus took it. It's been dealt with. We can now approach him in humility with a repentant heart, acknowledging, yes, God, I've been doing wrong, I've been thinking wrong, I've messed up here, knowing his grace is sufficient, knowing his mercy covers my mistakes. And in light of who he is, I have a complete change of mind. I change my direction because I see and acknowledge his goodness. Confession is step one in the repentance process. But confession without repentance keeps us in bondage. Confession without repentance keeps us in bondage. Has anyone ever acknowledged their wrongdoing to you, but they don't actually apologize for it? Doesn't that just make you feel so good? There's no repentance. There's no acknowledging, I'm not going to do that anymore. Well, it's the change. Repentance is the change of the way you think. You can right. confess a wrongdoing, but then it's time to change the way I think about what I've done, about where I'm going, about how what's coming out of me, right? Is, is love coming out of me? No, then I need Jesus. I need your love in this place. It's, it leads us to a change of the way we're thinking, 
if I'm, I'm looking at pornography and, I'm, and I am caught in this behavior and I confess, Lord, I don't, uh, this is awful, I just, I did this, and I confess it, but I don't change the way I think and allow Christ to come in and shift my mind and heal my mind and set me free in repentance. Repentance is I need you to move in me. I'm coming to you to change and put your mind in my mind. I'm just using that as an example. The enemy hates you. He hates repentance. He hates freedom. He hates that when, and when you repent, you have instant freedom. Walking in the way that you know Jesus has designed and created you to walk. Sin is against your design. It's not how he made you. We say it's human nature. Not anymore. It ain't your nature anymore. Come on, somebody. You have the nature of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Not just pastors and evangelists and teachers and prophets, all of us. And now you get to say, okay, Jesus, form yourself in me. This isn't you. I know it. I know it. So I'm not going to just confess that I did it. I'm going to ask you, change the way I think. Move me to a place of seeing the way you see, loving the way you love, moving the way you move. Help me. I'm needy. Remember your neediness, you needing him 24-7 is not to your shame, it's to your glory. Help me, Jesus. And how we feed our minds, how we feed our hearts, we can't just say, help me, Jesus, but then if we go back to the computer and turn it back on, that's not going to work, right? Change the way we think. Move to Jesus. Run to Jesus. If you have to keep your nose in that Bible for two solid weeks, keep your nose in the Bible. Come on. It's good. So why do we fear repentance? Why, why is there such a negative connotation with that word? When we, when we first hear that word, it's like, a, ugh, you know, there's this tension in you when you think about repenting. We're selfish, okay? Don't, Don't want to like admit being we're wrong. wrong. Fear. Fear. Fear of punishment. Ah. We. You have to change, right? Exactly. You cannot stay the same way. There has to be repentance. Literally means to change direction. We did a little um, activity with our um, our worship team and uh, last Sunday, yeah. Our our uh, prayer team. Prayer team before last Sunday, and we kind of ushered in a moment of repentance for the entire group, and, and we were included in this, and, and you could just feel like this, uh, it, you this want uncomfortable. You to say it out loud? Yeah. But can I say something? No. So, I'm kidding, yes. <laughs> I receive that. I submit. <laughs> Asbury, the revival that's happened and is happening and continues and will continue to be because the Holy Spirit never stops. He doesn't sleep. Um, but one of the things that was so powerful is that one of the first videos I ever heard online was this guy getting up and confessing his sin to the entire student body and repenting and gaining freedom. And so I was telling this to the prayer team last week, and I'm like, so we're going to do this right now. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to finish? We've, we've read so many times and heard so many times, revival begins with repentance. Yeah. So guess what? We're never going to experience revival if we never experience a spirit of repentance. Because that's where it begins. Confess your sins one to another. We love to pray for one another and Holy Spirit, you know, just move in power today and set people free and pour out revival in this place, but please do not make me admit what I've done wrong. To anyone else. To anyone else other than you. Anyone ever feel like that? Absolutely. Because we are so afraid. Of judgment. Of judgment. We're afraid of punishment. The word says... There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. If we continually walk around in guilt and shame over what we've done and trying to hide it and living in secrecy, we are not living in the love of Christ. We're living, living bound by religion, 
feeling like we constantly have to pay for what we've done, just like Judas did. Judas was so ridden with guilt, he felt like he is the one who had to pay instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to stir his conscience and lead him back to Jesus and repent of what he did, just like Peter did. He said, no, I have to pay for what I've done. I've, I've messed up too much. I've done too much wrong. I gotta pay for this. When Jesus was in the very act of doing that for him. I'm gonna use a testimony as an example. Jane and I talked earlier this week and she was in that prayer time and she repented out loud to everyone of a critical and judgmental spirit. And how the Lord had been dealing with her in this area and she said she went right from this seat back to her seat after the prayer time was over and the Lord gave her discernment instantly of the person that she was judging and being critical of. He gave her a love for that person and an eye to see where that person was and what they were going through and why they acted the way that they did. But if she hadn't turned and said, I'm being critical and judgmental, Lord, I'm, I'm repenting and, and giving this to you, she wouldn't have gotten to see through the eyes of love because love is how he sees us and how he wants us to see each other. When we, when we turn and gain the mind of Christ, his love comes. He, he, he heals that place. He gives us understanding about ourselves and about each other to move in love and to move in his power and to set us free. Freedom comes with repentance. Freedom. I, and, and, and so can I share this now? Is that okay? Or do you have anything else? Okay, I'm so excited about this. I picked up this little book that my papa let me borrow. And it's called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Have you heard of it? So good. Yes, I agree. It's just a tiny little book. On the inside, there's a note. I didn't get to read this to you yet, but it says Velda, and that's my Grammy. My Grammy's name was Velda. Do you pray and then believing, grab your boots and parasol, scrub the barrel, and get ready for the rain you ask to fall? Come on, somebody. Come on. So Brother Lawrence is just, I, I got to stand up. Can I stand up? This part is, this is so lovely. Why do you keep asking me if you I can do things? You're going to do it anyways. I can't. I'm like Jamie the other day. He's like, okay, I'm moving around now. Uh, right. I'm, I'm, I'm going. So I just want to read you who Brother Lawrence was. He was a monk from Paris. Brother Lawrence is a humble man who followed the direct path to communion with God. For him, there was no distinction between a time of business and a time of worship. He felt the presence of God whether he was working in the kitchen or worshiping in his church. This little record of the mind and heart of a man who saw God in all things is meant to serve as an inspiration and a guide for those who seek true and constant communication with their creator. You see, sin and unrepentance and a hard heart will always keep you from intimacy with your creator. And he desires that above everything else. That's why Jesus died on the cross to bring us back into the right intimacy, into relationship with the one that loves us, created us. He sent his son to die so that we could be with them forever. And Brother Lawrence, I love it because I hate doing the dishes. Uh, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> How many of you love doing the dishes? And I remember hearing um, his prayer, it's the Lord of all the pots and pans, because his job was in the kitchen. Lord of all pots and pans and things, make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. That was his prayer. It's the kind of guy he was. And as I read through the first conversation, this is a conversation between the author and Brother Lawrence. He said that he had always been get governed by love, without selfish views. 
and that having resolved to make the love of God the end of all his actions. Listen, did you hear that? Having resolved to make the love of God the end of all his actions. That line gutted me. Because I can really quickly understand where love is moving in my actions and where it is not. And I run to Jesus. Quickly, quickly run to Jesus. He found reasons to be well satisfied with his method. That he was pleased when he could take up a straw from the ground for the love of God. Seeking him only and nothing else, not even his gifts. He was happy to pick up the trash off the floor for the love of God. He continued, he said, I engaged in a religious life only for the love of God. And I have endeavored to act only for him. Whatever becomes of me, whatever I I be, lost or saved, I will always continue to act purely for the love of God. I shall have this good at least, that till death I shall have done all that is in me to love him. And he continues to share his testimony and his relationship with the Lord. And then he begins to talk about what he, when he does something wrong. And I like this guy a lot. Receive this this morning. He says that when an, on an occasion of practicing some virtue to offer, he addressed himself to God saying, Lord, I cannot do this unless thou enablest me. And that then he received strength more than sufficient. I can't do this. I can't get past this sin. I can't get through or do what you are telling or calling me to do unless you enable me to do it. He was fully, completely reliant on Christ Jesus. Listen, that when he had failed in his duty, what? He failed? When he had failed in his duty, confessed his fault saying to God, I shall never do otherwise if you leave me to myself. It is you who must hinder my falling and mend what is amiss. That after he gave himself no further uneasiness about it, he says, he goes back to the Lord and he says, it's you who is going to help me and carry me and keep me. It is you that has given me everything I need to do this and I will not do it without you. When he failed, he went right back to God. He said, I need you. Come into this area of failure. Come into this place of sin. And then he gave no further uneasiness about it. That, that means that once he went and he confessed and repented to the Lord, he didn't beat himself up for 12 more days over the thing he did wrong or 12 more minutes or 12 more hours. He went back to loving on God and leaning into him. That he was very sensible of his faults but not discouraged by them. Come on, somebody. That he was very sensible of his faults, but not discouraged by them. That he confessed them to God, but did not plead against him to excuse them. When he had done so, he peaceably resumed his usual practice of love and adoration. Listen, he didn't go, Jesus, please forgive me, please forgive me, please. Oh, I hope you'll forgive me. I hope you'll forgive me. Did he? He confessed his sin knowing that what? When you confess and repent, when you turn to Christ, is it maybe going to be forgiven or is it already done? Every sin you'll ever do for, for the rest of your earthly life, is it already taken care of? Are you confident of that? Are you confident that he covered all of it? So then he doesn't sit and stew in it and he doesn't let it destroy him unto death. He picks up the life of Christ and he says, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. He peaceably resumes his usual practice of love and adoration. So instead of navel gazing, right? You guys know what that means? Just kind of like looking at myself and after I've done something wrong, I have this tendency to, you idiot, why did you do that? And you, and you beat yourself up. Is Jesus doing that? No. 
Is he hounding you? Is he, I can't believe this. I can't believe you did that. Why in the world did you do that again? We've been here before. Come on. No. And you know what Brother Lawrence did is he went back to, it says, love and adoration. When you have repented and you've confessed, go back to love and adoration of Jesus. That is repentance without regret. That's what the scripture said. I have one more thing. It's just, it's just like everyday ordinary life. He was a dishwasher. He was a monk, yes, but he was a dishwasher. He had everyday ordinary things he had to do. And I mean, he was a monk. Goodness, what could he have done wrong? Right? I mean, that's what I think when I'm reading this. But he had such a gentle way of bringing it to Jesus and then releasing it to him. It says that all possible kinds of mortification, humiliation, shame, if they were void of the love of God, could not efface a single sin, that we ought without anxiety to expect the pardon of our sins from the blood of Jesus Christ, only endeavoring to love him with all of our hearts. He had an expectance of complete forgiveness, so he didn't dwell on the sin. He moved into Christ. He didn't stay. Stay in that place of shame, guilt, and condemnation because there is no shame, guilt, and condemnation when you are in Christ Jesus. He moved into Jesus, loving and adoring him and turning his face to him and worshiping him. This is the practice of repentance, the practice of living wide open and surrendered and laid out for the Lord. And I love it because it's not, he, he, he just so gentle. When you do something wrong, don't wait, run to Jesus. Don't harden your heart. Let him in. Turn quickly. Move quickly to the Savior. And guess what? Once you've done that and you've talked to him, and remember, it's repentance. It's not, please forgive me, please forgive me. It's forgiven. There is a confidence in his forgiveness that he wants you to rise up and it's already done. So when you take it to him and you repent, you don't sit in it. You turn and you change the way you think and you keep going. You take his hand. You let him lead you out of that place into the marvelous light of what he has for you quickly. Would you stand?